So welcome to Methods in Sinology, the lecture series organized by uh, Mariana uh, Kina, PhD student at uh, Zurich University and Madalena Poli, postdoctoral fellow at Pomona University. And I am the chair today, Lu Wang, a PhD candidate at Western University Canada. So I, I am very excited to introduce our speaker today, Professor Ruth Moster. She is Professor of History and World History Center Director at the University of Pittsburgh. She is the author most recently of the Yellow River in Natural and Unnatural History, published by Yale University Press in 2021. She is also the project director and principal investigator of the World Historical Gazetteer, a digital spatial history infrastructure project to organize global information about named places. So her lecture today is entitled Spatial and Environmental Methods and the Chinese Path, a Yellow River Walkthrough. So Professor Mostyn, thank you so much for coming to this lecture. And now the floor is all yours. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much for that um, kind introduction and for inviting me to join your seminar. So um, I'm thinking because this is a fairly small group, we can sort of keep this informal rather than me. I'll, I'll pause during my talk and ask for questions and comments along the way rather than um, just kind of talking straight through for an hour. And uh, my understanding from uh, Mariana and Madalena and uh, Lu Wang is that um, really this is an opportunity for me to focus a little bit on uh, my intellectual genealogy and my methodologies and questions that I continue to find challenging. So I'm going to be um, in some ways delivering a sort of standard-ish book talk about my Yellow River book, but really um, focusing on how it came to be a book um, and on the methods I use and um, the challenges that remain. So um, I'm looking forward to something that's really um, pretty conversational. So um, let us see how that goes and I will share my screen. So can you all see that? So, um, so what I wanna talk about today um, is, uh, as I said, um, it's sort of a standard book talk and the book that I published about a year ago is The Yellow River, A Natural and Unnatural History. It is a long-term, large-scale history of the entire watershed of the Yellow River. And um, the way I came to write this book is that a uh, few reasons. One is that as I was finishing my first book, which I'm going to be touching on a little bit more in my talk next week, uh, my first book is Dividing the Realm in Order to Govern the Spatial Organization of the Song State, 960 to 1276. And um, that was a book that really focused on, I mean, all of my work, I should say, is about geography. It's about historical geography. And it's about the way that humans come to create certain kinds of landscapes to interact with those landscapes, to map them, how those landscapes change over time and how all of this is reflective of social power. And my first book, which was about administrative geography published in 2011, um, I knew I wanted to do something that sort of grew out of that book in certain ways that still allowed me to think about spatial organization in China, but I was really determined to focus on something that existed tangibly in the actual physical environment as opposed to administrative geography, which is completely abstract. And so that's one reason that I started getting really interested in environmental history and in river history. The other piece of the genealogy of this particular book is that at that time, I was working at the University of California, Merced, I've, since I moved five years ago, five and a half years ago, to the University of Pittsburgh. But when I started working on this book, I was in Merced. And uh, Merced is located in the Central Valley of California, which is one of the most hyper-managed water landscapes 
anywhere in the world and also is one where the way that the floodplain is managed, the valley that I was living in, and the way that rivers are managed in the mountains from which they originate are very different. And my office window at Merced looked out every day on this sort of network of reservoirs and canals and out towards the mountains from where these rivers originated. And so I got started getting really interested in rivers. So basically, well, then I guess I'll say a third thing, which is that um, I'm really interested. I'm a Chinese historian. I'm also a world historian. And so I'm really interested in long-term large scale phenomena, which is also, as I start to talk about methods, why um, some of the digital methods I use, some of the methods that are sort of um, attentive to environmental science um, are really things that allow me to approach much, much larger temporal and spatial scales than is typical for historians. And so I was also looking for a project that would be amenable to something that covers thousands of square miles and thousands of years of history. And all of these things kind of led me to the study of the Yellow River and uh, resulted in this book that you see here on the slide. You can see my slide, right? Wait, am I not sharing? I am sharing. You can see my slide, right? Yes? Yes, yes. Okay, good, good. I didn't see the, uh, the sort of the green box around it for a minute. Um, so that's what led me to this book that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and as I said, I'm interested in the entirety of the watershed. And so here, stretching um, all the way from the northeastern part of the Tibetan Plateau, the point of origin of the Yellow River, all the way to the floodplain. Um, and so you can see this uh, several thousand um, kilometer uh, east to west uh, breadth of the Yellow River. And um, also, as you can start to see here on this slide, interested, I'm interested in using GIS, spatial methods. Um, I will say also in terms of methods, and this will be a theme of my whole talk and something, something that we can explore in our conversation, this would have been an absolutely impossible first book to write, partly because it's so ambitious, but also because I um, relied so much and always rely in my book so much on doing collaborative work and on working with um, students, people with technical expertise. I myself have only really pretty elementary skills in uh, GIS and database analysis and visualization. And so all of the maps and data analysis that you see here are things that I have been able to accomplish because I have had the great luxury of having um, uh, funding to hire students. I've had collaborators, postdoctoral fellows. And so this is very much a case. You know, one of the things we can talk about is the structure of academia, labor, hierarchy in academia. I am the grateful beneficiary of having started this work at a time that um, I can benefit from the um, labor of other people, always people who are uh, less well paid, have less stable jobs than myself. And um, what you see here is a map uh, that was created by my postdoctoral fellow, Ryan Horn. Um, and so I want to really make sure, I always try to make sure to um, ethically uh, acknowledge the work of the people who have made it possible for me to publish this book. And so you see here um, the entire Yellow River watershed, a range of kinds of vegetation, and then this white outline is the less plateau. And um, essentially, I think I'll move on to the next slide. The argument of my book and the framework of my book is about the interaction between these two regions of the Yellow River. Um, to the west, the Les Plateau, which is where the erosion for which the Yellow River is famous originates, and to the east, the alluvial plain, the flood plain, which um, is highly prone to flooding. You can see here in a variety of colors um, all of the courses that the Yellow River has occupied throughout history, and um, it is because of the very high sediment load as well as the fact 
that the floodplain is is so very flat that the river um, can meander um, over this very wide area. And absent human intervention, this the alluvial plain would be a region of wetlands, multiple river courses, many tributaries. And the reason it does not it does not have that feature is because of intensive human intervention. Um, so as I said, one uh, this is a highly interdisciplinary book. I really, really, and, and sort of in my kind of thoughts about the genealogy of why I wanted to write this book, how I came to write it, um, what this book is methodologically, what I like to do methodologically, I really, I get very restless when I'm only working as a historian. Um, and so one of the things I have only ever really been trained as a historian, I'm partially trained as a geographer, I've always hung around with geographers and information scientists, but for this book I knew also that I would be using a lot of, in, of, of environmental science as well. And that is really entirely self-educated, but not really in a very sophisticated way. Um, I just started reading articles about environmental science. For me as a historian, those articles kind of were not that hard to make sense of because they follow a sort of narrative structure that felt familiar to me as a historian, a sort of narrative of how some phenomenon changed over time and why. Um, the way I read those articles is always absolutely to kind of read the introduction and conclusion, to sort of skim through the method sections. I want to know how the authors arrived at their conclusions, but absolutely never, you know, to this day um, have I really, you know, I, I am not sophisticated about the methods. I'm able to sort of know what some methods are. I've tried to talk to a number of environmental scientists. I'm part of a collaborative project right now between historians and environmental scientists, but um, I've just kind of, you know, leaped in and kind of felt, learned to feel a sense of comfort with my ignorance as well as my knowledge in incorporating a range of disciplines into my work. So, um, so this slide is about an introduction to the, the, to the less soil, which is so significant to the book I wrote. Um, you can see here in this um, electron, this this mic, this um, mic, mic, microscope photograph, that one of the things that's really characteristic of this particular soil is that it has grains of different shapes with um, sort of interstices with open spaces between the grains. And what this means is that and this is a quote from one of the. Um, environmental science articles that I learned a lot from as I was working on this project, that when there's vegetation, it's very resistant to erosion because the vegetation can grow thickly, it's fertile soil, it can get develop great root structures, but when the vegetation is removed, for that reason, it can um, just sort of become dust and fly away. And this is the set of images that I um, always call my less selfies. Right, because this is just sort of me, this is uh, me near near Zhengzhou on one of my field trips, sort of holding a clump of this less soil and just you know manipulating it. And you can see by the bottom right image that it just um, sort of flies away into dust. And um, so I should also say that for this project, I was you know among the things I am not trained as is someone who knows how to do any kind of field work, right? I'm not an anthropologist. I'm not an environmental scientist. Um, I was trained as a Song historian. I don't do field work or archival work in the way that modern historians do. Um, but I knew that it was gonna be really important as I was coming to get to know this river for me to uh, visit it, experience it in person. Um, I was lucky enough to develop relationships with a number of historians of the Yellow River in China, and to make some visits to the river, take photographs, and just kind of see what I could see. 
Um, so uh, again, I, I, I said this was a field trip, which it kind of was, but not like a proper field trip where I had a hypothesis and I had methods and I had instruments. It was just kind of me looking around. Um, and so that's also a piece of how this book came together and a way that um, in a sense, I'm, I'm sort of seeing as I'm talking that a theme of this talk is um, what you can do if you put together your expertise and your ignorance, right? And feel like you there's a lot you can say. I think there's a lot that any of us can say as scholars if we are sort of, you know, willing to inhabit and speak with some confidence, even about things that we don't know that much about, right? As long as, of course, we want to do it um, honestly, humbly, and um, with honor to our collaborators from whom we learn. Um, let me maybe pause there for a second, since, like I said, since it's a small group, I don't, and I don't want to just kind of talk into the void for a long time. So um, I'd be happy to, you know, pause here and have some comments and questions if, if anyone has any thoughts at this point. And if sure. not, so, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, I mean, if there, if you have any questions, you're welcome to uh, use the raise your hand feature, then I will invite you to unmute yourself to ask a question. Um, otherwise, you can type in your question in the chat. Um, yeah, and if no one has any questions at this point, I'll also keep going, but I just want to kind of pause along the way since it's a small group. Uh, I actually have um, a quick question because you already mentioned twice that you want to honor to and to ethnically acknowledge the people who are involved and who are in charge of the more technical side, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this comes up quite often when it's um, about digital humanities, uh, how the principal investigator sees the people who do the most of the coding and such. So um, do you think that this should be, this work should be more of a support staff work as it's all very often done in some research institutes, for example, or are those people uh, truly researchers uh, for you, for example? You know, it depends. Um, you know, along the way, I've worked with people who are staff people. I've worked with people who are professors, grad students, undergraduate students and um, you know it's a whole ecosystem right of different kinds of people and one of the things that the sciences I think are much much better at than the humanities is to um, author authorship off, offer authorship credit to all of those kinds of people it's there's not really you know if I were writing this book, with the kinds of authorship conventions that are typical in scientific articles, you know, there would be, I don't know, 20 co-authors, right? Um, but we don't really have a way to do that. Um, you know, in the acknowledgements of my book, I named everybody and I tried to be really comprehensive in my acknowledgements because I worry so much about these things. Um, but outside of acknowledgements, there's not really a way to do it. Um, the appendix of my book, which is the which is a methods discussion, I did co-author with um, my postdoc, who I did a lot of my work with, and I also I think on the title page of the book it also says it has me as the author and then him as listed. I forget exactly what the wording is, but him listed as the author of the database and data visualizations. Um, so there's a, you know, there's an aspect of this that is about recognizing collaborators in, um, in technical projects. And also another aspect that I, that I also think a lot about, which is, you know, myself as a scholar in the United States, whose work on Chinese history rests so much on the prior expertise of Chinese colleagues, the um, generous hosting of time in China from Chinese colleagues. And that's a different kind of 
sort of collaboration that I think is really important to acknowledge, but that also we don't really have a way to manage the way that, ac that academia is structured. Thank you. Yeah, I saw another hand up, I think. Um, yes. Um, mm -hmm. thank, thank you so much for the talk, um, for the uh, first part of the talk, I think. So I'm doing the water management in Jiangnan areas. So I'm actually- that again? I'm doing water management in the Jiangnan mm -hmm. areas. So I'm constantly um, curious about how could we really see the, understand the, have interaction with the right metrics and um, science part of the literature. It's, you, you know, if we just go to the Google, um, Google scholars, type keywords like Yellow River or the Thai Lake, it's just like, boom. And also sometimes I also feel like, I mean, I'm trained first as a finance major and then historian. And just like, I also feel some difficulties to really understand and the languages or the jargons of the natural scientists. So I'm just mm -hmm. curious, like, if you have any tips, and I was even thinking about the undergrad courses on those work mm -hmm. management, but I'm just curious, right. like, how you push yourself and also go flying out of the company to have like, this wonderful conversation and dialogue. Right. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, and it, I think it's exactly like you said, right? You go to Google Scholar, you start typing in keywords and boom, that's pretty much how I proceeded to start finding environmental science articles and um, just kind of um, read pretty intensively, just, you know, read various articles, looked at the footnotes, followed footnotes, um, started seeing the same, you know, I mean, the same way that we're trained to sort of become experts in the literature as historians, right? You sort of figure out who the major names are, you figure out methods, you know, um, and literature over time, just by kind of reading and immersing yourself in the reading. And so that's pretty much what I did, but also always along the way, both when I, especially when I was starting the project, when I was still at University of California Merced, which was a small and very interdisciplinary minded university. And so it was easy for me to just kind of start chatting about the work with my colleagues in environmental science and to present my very early stage work a few times at environmental science seminars that they hosted um, on the campus, just kind of informal work in progress seminars. And, um, you know, that allowed me to just sort of start asking questions, ask if I was on the right talk, ask if I was missing something, right, and just kind of make sure that I, you know, had scientists around me who were kind of just making sure I was not making any terrible mistakes, basically. Um, and I've, you know, maintained some of those kinds of collaborations over time. I never took any undergraduate, I mean, neither as an undergraduate or as a grad student. And, you know, not since then ever have I taken any classes in environmental science, which I kind of regret, um, you know, but on the other hand, I mean, life is short, right? I, I, it took me 10 years already. I mean, a full 10 years, I guess I should have probably said that already. I worked, it took me 10 years between when I first started scoping out this project and when my book was published. And that's a long time. And I learned a lot during those 10 years, but also, I mean, when I was talking before about, you just have to kind of feel if you want to do a project like this and you may well not, it's a really, I know it's a pretty unusual habit of mine to want to do something like what I did. And one of the things that it requires is just sort of a comfort level with your own ignorance, right? And with being ready to sort of being willing to sort of move all the way on through to publication, you know, knowing that there's still so many things you don't know about. And in my case, that is not only environmental science, but also because this is a 3000 year history. I, there are many, many aspects of like the actual, you know, history of policy and management and social history 
on the Yellow River that I don't know a thing about. I mean, there are entire books written about one flood, which for me is just one of, you know, I mean, any one of a number of significant events in Yellow River history, there are entire books written about events that for me are just one of sort of 3000, you know, nodes in a database, right? Um, and so, you know, um, there's so much, I, I feel like, in a sense, this is a book that's sort of, you know, a, a kind of celebration of an old style of um, grand narrative, right, rather than a kind of sort of philologically deep, you know, archival exploration of the kind that I think is more typical today. Thank you so much. Very yeah, well, let me move on and, and then I'll, um, I'll find another pausing spot um, along the way. So, um, so another one of the things is I was starting to realize that my history of the river was really actually a history of soil more than it was a history of water. It's a history of what happened to erosion on the Les Plateau. And this article and this image from this article was one of the environmental history articles that made a really big impression on me. And, um, Right, it's essentially, it, it reads as a little bit confusing because it reads from right to left. Um, I should say that part of my style of how to read these environmental, his, uh, environmental science articles was really to zero in on the images, partly because I'm a very visual thinker and also because that was just, you know, for me as someone who couldn't make sense of the methods um, and was just kind of reading for the conclusions, the images is really where a lot of that kind of material lies. Um, so these are based on soil cores, right? I know that the method here is to sort of take soil cores at different um, places along the river to and to test the, you know, to use um, organic material in the soil in order to be able to date uh, the soil and then to sort of basically add up how much sediment accumulation happened at, you know, uh, during history. So starting in the Pleistocene 12,000 years ago, the end of the last ice age, uh, moving through the Holocene climatic optimum when temperatures were warm and moisture was significant and is sort of the beginning of human farming. During these periods, the amount of erosion was very low, um, rising, tripling really from about 0.2% um, at uh, 0 0.2 centimeters to per year, all the way up to about 0 0.6 centimeters per year by the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, as um, farming became more intensive, populations grew, um, state power started to rise, and then by the imperial era, um, moving all the way up to um, really by the modern era, the modern, the imperial era and the modern era, um, tripling again. And so this made a big impression on me in, you know, thinking about what this history of erosion was that I was going to tell. Um, another version of the same data, this is actually the first, as I was very, very first starting to scope out this topic, this article by um, um, Xu Jiangxin was the first article I found about the changing rate of sedimentation in the Yellow River and really in some ways is the article that launched this whole project. I mean, that made me feel confident that I could learn from articles like this and that the story was interesting and that I could tie, I mean, the erosion story was interesting and that I could tie it to things that I already knew about as a historian of China. Um, and so this was just, this was really mind blowing for me. And, you know, one thing I have to say methodologically and is just, um, you know, follow your instincts, right? Allow yourself to have your mind blown at the beginning of a project, right? When you're at that very early stage of a project, some of you are PhD students, some of you are, are um, early career scholars, maybe scoping out a second project. And it's still, you know, even though it's been almost 10 years since I saw this graph, I still remember how significant it was for me, you know, when I had those, huh, history of the Yellow River, I wonder if it's interesting, right, and I saw 
this. And I was like, oh my God, this is the thing I want to learn more about. It's this thing. This is what I want to understand. Right. And um, I would have written an entirely different book, I am sure, if I didn't sort of um, let myself hear that that's what I was thinking when I saw this image. Um, and what's interesting to me about it, the reason what was so interesting to me when I saw this, the answer is basically that there's a sort of slowly rising rate of erosion from about 10,000 years ago until about 1,000 years ago. And then about a thousand years ago, something significant happened. And then the sort of later imperial rate of erosion again rises sort of within an order of magnitude, right? This is a sort of a logarithmic chart. So this is from, um, you know, 0.1 centimeters per year to, um, to one centimeter and then from one to 10 with this really interesting point of rupture in between. Um, and is basically just to sort of go back, um, right, different rate of calculation of the sedimentation rate, different data set, but kind of consistent, right? And so in terms of what I, you know, to this day, I will say very frankly, I don't understand why the sedimentation rates are um, accounted differently in these two articles. But what I'm hanging on to as sort of being my kind of sense of confidence is that this rapidly rising rate of sedimentation, right? This is 2000 years ago. And here again, roughly about between 2000 years ago and 1000 years ago, here's this point of rupture and then this rapidly rising rate. And so, um, you know, I feel like I find enough consistency between these two different articles, two different scholars, two different data sets, clearly two different methodologies. And yet for me as a historian, I don't care about the precise rate of erosion. I'm interested in times when meaningful things happened. Um, that's the consistency I'm looking for between them. Um, and then, right, and then again, a third article, different environmental scientist um, looking in this case at changes in the amount of forestation over time and um, also periodizing the rate of erosion. And so all of this is sort of starting to triangulate in towards something that I feel increasingly confident about. Interestingly, and on this sl sl slide I included, um, the, although um, Hu Xiaobin is an environmental scientist, it's this sort of interesting iterative process where what he is using in part, right, he's using geological rec records such as pollen, but he's also using historical literature. Shen Yanhai here is the great historian of human history on the Les Plateau, who also, who has used um, historical sources in order to make estimates about forestation and deforestation. So it's a really interesting sort of interdisciplinary process where Hu Xiaobin, reads Shunyan Hai, who's a historian, incorporates Shunyan Hai's work into his work as an environmental scientist. And then I, as a historian, read Hu Xiaobin and move it back into my work as a historian. So um, I think that's cool. Um, and this is also work, again, that just sort of helps me get this sense of how this rising rate of sedimentation happened on the Les Plateau and when it happened um, and why it happened, right? And the conclusion here from, from Hu Xiaobin, this um, environmental scientist, is that um, this started about a thousand years ago, consistent with what I was just saying, and that it was as a result of um, human destruction of vegetation an anthropogenic disturbance of the environment. There is not some other reason, right? I started this project with some hypotheses about climate change that did not really, as it turned out, come to pass, right? This is all a human story. Um, right, it's also, of course, um, a story about, um, right, so 
Right. So then that, so once I have this sort of narrative of what happened about a thousand years ago, and I said that was the thing that I saw in that um, Xu Jiongxin article that was like, oh my God, here, I think I know something, right? Um, I referenced my first book, wanting to have a second book, as we all do, that in some ways grows out of the first book. And my first book was about the administrative geography of the Song Dynasty. And I knew, I was absolutely clear that there had been a massive expansion of population and even more so of fortifications of um, garrisons, forts, military outposts, and so on along the Song Xixia border, which you can see here um, most clearly. Well, all these maps show versions of it. So um, the sort of the big picture here in this uh, map on the left, which I did not create, this um, map in the middle, which shows the boundary of um, Song and Xixia through the middle of the Ordos, this um, less plateau region, and then also a map that I did not create. And then the third, um, which is a map by myself and um, Ryan Horn, my postdoc, uh, based on data that we created together. And I'll say a little bit more about the data that shows this sort of massive um, you know, density of fortifications right along the border between the Northern Song and the Xixia. And um, what this shows, the stars are prefectures, sort of large, kind of middle-sized, um, well, large outposts of government activity, basically of local government. The uh, diamonds are counties, and then the dots are all the different kinds of sub-county units. And this comes from the great Tan Chi Xiang Atlas, the Zhongguo Li Shi Di Tu Qi, the historical atlas of China. Um, the uh, prefectures and counties come from the China Historical GIS. I was able to just kind of, um, you know, download and make use of that existing data, which was great. And the um, sub-county units, um, sort of painstakingly by hand, with the help of a whole series of undergraduate students over you know, a couple of years of digitizing and cleaning and reorganizing, um, basically scanned and hand digitized each sub-county unit recorded anywhere in the Tan Chi Xiang Atlas in this region of the Les Plateau that I was interested in. So, you know, there too, absolutely a project I would not have had the time to do myself without that series of student research assistants. Um, but this is what, and so I started out pretty early based on my pre-existing knowledge as I started this book to think that this is the key to what happened about a thousand years ago is all of these newly built forts um, right across, right? And here's the great bend of the Yellow River. You can see it um, on a couple of right here. You can see it. Do you see my cursor? Can you see my cursor? Yep. Right. And so, you know, here's the Yellow River sort of bending, you know, to the north to the east, back to the south, right? And then this um, Song Xixia border um, right across it. Um, and basically some information, right? Also always as I work on this project, wanting to incorporate historical sources because that's what I do. I'm a historian, right? Finding information about the details of this Song fortification strategy. There is lots that's been written about it in English and Chinese. There's a lot of secondary sources about it, right? Everything about the Song Xixia War um, re references material. A lot of it, a lot of the Chinese sources originally are from Xu Zhu Zhu Hongjian, Chang Bian. Um, lots and lots and lots of detailed information about exactly where the forts are, how many people were in them, when they were established, and so on. So even these grand claims I make, right, that at the scale of 3,000 years, something happened about 1,000 years ago, it all has to be anchored in historical sources. Um, and right, more information about this, um, again, a photograph from my field trips that shows what this super eroded landscape 
looks like today. And again, sort of putting field trips in quotes because I myself am not a scientist who can measure erosion rates. I can just look out over this site that I know from historical sources was fertile and densely populated with forts in the Northern Song and look at it now and just kind of say, whoa, my mind is blown. Look at that erosion. Right. And that's, as I said, as I've been saying, that's that's good enough for me for what I'm trying to do in this book and with my scholarship. And then a series of maps based on that data set that I described um, that just that depict the um, dense fortification of this region over time or over. I mean, between in this case, between the um, the middle of the tongue the early Northern Song and the late Northern Song. Um, right, and then a sort of reference of where we're talking about. This, uh, the deforestation of the Les Plateau proceeded over time um, into the, the Ming Great Wall, Qing forestry and farming, um, right? And there I'm just, again, reading, this is basically comes from reading historical sources and really relying a lot on secondary sources since it's a 3000 year book. Absolutely, I zeroed in on primary sources to an extent as historians, we have to do that, but I would not have been able to do a 3000 year narrative if I felt like I had to become the absolute like world's leading expert about every single era during that 3000 year history. Um, in that way also, this is really much more a sort of a second book kind of book than a first book kind of book um, is that, you know, the amount that I had to sort of prove and demonstrate about my ability to read and interpret primary sources was much less for this book than it was for the previous book. I had the freedom to really just kind of range widely and kind of follow my interests rather than um, proving things. I mean, I had to prove my arguments. I didn't have to prove things to a still rather conservative profession in the same way that I had to for my first book. Um, I wanna now move into a conversation about um, a little bit more about my data and my methods and the sort of digital humanities part of this, but let me pause again and ask if anyone has any questions or comments or just anything that all of this raises. Yeah, Madalena. Yeah, I do have a question, but it may be something you're going to address now. <laughs> so if it is just, you know, um, wait for later. And it's about, you often say that you, um, how to, that, that you don't necessarily go deep into every specific aspect, you kind of get it and, and then move on for your own research. And I was curious about how you negotiate that with yourself in the sense mm. of, you know, I, I do use some digital humanities principles but I also am not a digital person I don't know how to code for example and they try to do the same in the sense of understanding some of the like starting with a research question if I have it and then trying to understand what this method can give me but without having to be to fully understand the entire method and how it proceeds mm -hmm. and then I kind of want to move forward from that in 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 my case in in looking at um, textual analysis so I was curious to know what yeah, what, like, do you really study the method entirely or do you trust just the people who are doing this research? Um, what do you do exactly in, in the background before getting, you know, to your own research, if, if that makes sense? Um, yeah, um, yeah, I think some of it, I mean, what I was trying to describe with the environmental science research is just to read enough that I started to see patterns emerge. Mm. Right. So that I didn't have to, you know, pattern, I mean, patterns of conclusions, patterns of methods, um, patterns of citation. Right. So that I didn't have to sort of, you know, rely on my outsider's trust of any single one thing. I think I sort of kind of read more redundantly in the environmental science literature than I typically do in historical literature um, because that was sort of my way of kind of building a sense of trust myself. Um, and then, you know, with the, and I'll get 
in a couple of minutes, I'll get more into some of the, the methods on the DH side of things. And that's different because even though I'm not the person writing the code or running the SQL queries on a database, I'm working, you know, literally like side by side, looking at a computer screen together with, you know, my students who do the data creation with my, you know, postdoc who did the database design and the database analysis. Um, and I, you know, um, just like, you know, meeting, I mean, we work together really intensively, you know, day by day and week by week, you know, with me asking a lot of questions when something doesn't make sense to me, um, with me, you know, and, and I'll show you in a minute that, you know, all of the data I use ultimately comes from somewhere that I know and that I trust and understand as a historian. And I'm, even though I'm not the one for the most part, you know, sort of like doing either just like the heavy, just like lift of assembling and cleaning the data or the coding, um, I'm working really closely with the people who are doing that. Um, I'm specifying what I need the design to look like. And I'm asking as many questions as I need to make sure I know what they're doing. And I'm always sort of kind of testing it against my knowledge as a historian, right? So I'm always able to say, wait, that doesn't look right, right? And then to ask enough questions, either to say, huh, I guess I have to re revise my preconceptions or to say, oh, I see what's missing here. You know, we need this additional data or we need to run this query in a different way or something. Yeah. OK, I understand. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so actually, I also have a question. Uh, for Professor Master, um, I know you're you're talking about uh, interpreting secondary sources, but I still have a question about collecting primary sources for especially such a large project, you know, ranging from Paleolithic period to modern time. So oftentimes we may find for a certain period the information is it, there's such little information, so it makes us to uh, di so difficult to collecting data and on the contrary for another period where, where we see abundant of, of, of data, which also makes us difficult to decide what to use. So um, I wonder if you can give us some suggestions uh, about how to balance this unevenness mm -hmm. on data collecting. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm gonna hold on to that because that's what I'm about to get to. So um, let me, let me move on and um, you maybe you want, you'll re-ask that question perhaps in another way next time I pause. Um, so, uh, uh, well, let me just move on at that point. So, um, so another one of the books that I read, one of those sort of, this is what my project is gonna look like. I showed you that chart from that um, Xu Jiangxin article about the history of erosion. The other thing, that I read that, that I was like, that's it. That's what my next book is gonna be about was a book um, by uh, this um, Shen Yi, uh, sort of early 20th century, really interesting figure in the history of Republican China, who among many, many other accomplishments wrote a book called the Huanghe Nianbiao, the Yellow River Annals, which is just sort of a whole book of about 3000 events in Yellow River history drawn from primary sources. And just sort of like this year, according to this source, this happened, right? And when I started writing my book, I was like, oh, this is gonna be super easy because what I'm gonna do is digitize the Huang Hun Yan Biao. In fact, I figured out there was already a digital edition. So awesome. I'm gonna make it into a database. I'm gonna map it. I'm gonna finish this book really quickly. Great. Um, it did not work out that way. It became much more complicated, but basically um, I started with, in terms, in, in answer to your question, Luang, um, I started with, I didn't start by going to the primary sources. What I started with was Huang Hun Yan Biao, right? With this 3,754 events. 
And then, um, as I say here on the slide, 62 lists and tables from 10 publications, one of which was the Huang Hun Yan Biao, right? And each of those sources links back to the primary sources that it draws from. And so um, that became right. The upper course, as I was saying, the middle course data came from the Zhongguo Li Shi Di Tu Ji. So it was that digitized source for the time period that I'm most familiar with for the song. I know that most of that comes from um, Changbian. And then for this um, downstream data, um, all of these lists and tables from these 10 publications I worked with all include excerpts from the primary sources. And um, you can see here this table A1, which is a screenshot from the book, from the appendix to the book, um, lists the different data sources that I used for context. Um, where did I get my changing river courses from? Where did I get my counties and prefectures from? Right, All of that is included here in this um, chart on the bottom left of the slide. And then in the middle here, um, this is a piece of my database within this um, Jupyter Notebook environment, which was my collaborative environment with the postdoc who did the final database design and data analysis for the book. Um, I Let me move on. Um, right, and then this also involves, and this is also a screenshot from the book, um, really complicated SQL queries that my postdoc designed as I was finishing the book. And, you know, I could not have written these queries, but like I said, we were literally just sitting side by side or during the pandemic sitting, you know, next to each other on our Zoom screens with me, you know, asked saying, okay, well, why don't you vary this parameter? Why don't you have it? Let's have it. Let's look, let's see what this looks like with a different start date or a different end date or different event types. And just like sitting together, running these queries, looking at the results. Um, I should say this postdoc uh, did not know, I mean, he is a, a, an extraordinary digital humanist, currently works at the UC Santa Barbara Library. Um, his background is in the classical Mediterranean. So the idea of working with really old data in non-English languages was absolutely like it was, it was easy for him to get used to that, but does not know a thing about Chinese history. And it was a really remains to this day, actually, I'll show you a slide in a second of what we're doing now, um, remains a really meaningful combination. But this is, um, you know, as it, as it says in the in the caption here, this is a generic query about events in locations, um, right, on the floodplain, you know, with the ability to sort of vary what kinds of events, where and when, in order to generate results and maps. But it is this hard to put all of that together based on the database we that, that he designed, that, well, I should say that we designed together. Um, we're working, we're still working on this. Um, Ryan, my, po my former postdoc now at the UC Santa Barbara Library, and um, one of my current grad students, Sharon Zhang, John Zhang, um, who's with me at Pitt, although she's um, physically in California right now. And um, one of the things I have been very eager to do throughout this project is not only to write the book, but also to publish a digital atlas. And um, part of the reason why that query that you saw on the last slide was so complex is that we kind of got to the point that there were good enough we, you know, we could we could we could generate queries with results that I was confident in that were adequate to the book I was publishing. But what we never did was develop a sort of clean, perfect gazetteer. And, and in my talk next week, I'll be talking about gazetteers. It's basically a, a, it's always complicated to a Chinese audience because when we hear gazetteer in English, we think defunct. But gazetteer is also just a sort of generic name for databases of named places. And um, although gazetteers are one of my core research areas and areas of expertise, um, ironically for the Yellow River book, 
we never developed a clean, perfect gazetteer. So this summer, um, consulting with Ryan and with the, you know, terrific, you know, just absolutely um, expert labor of my grad student, Sharon, um, we've been cleaning up the place data and creating this gazetteer. This is a screenshot from um, Google Drive. You know, we're in the final, final, final stages now of cleaning this up. And um, basically, right, you know, some of the challenges here, and you can see this, um, is like, what do you do, right, if you want to have one entity per place? If you have one place that's called Jingdong and one place that's called Jingdong Xilu, and one place that's called Jingdong Lu, and one place that's Jingdong Zhu Lu, or Zhu Jun, right? Um, are these the same place? Are they different places? How do you decide how to represent them in a database, right? Um, this is where the sort of, you know, digital humanities work of database design and just like the heavy, heavy lift of tedious labor and the interesting semantic questions about how history works all meet up with one another. Um, so, so this is literally, this is what we are doing, you know, right now, meeting every day. Um, one of the things I wanna say here is, I'll say a few things. One is that um, compared to the kind of digital humanities work that some people do, mine is kind of dumb and simple. I'm just, you can, a lot of it can be done in just like flat files like this, just plain old spreadsheets that are lists, right? And then counting stuff. And, you know, you saw a couple of slides ago, that complicated query from that Jupyter notebook environment, that sort of long, you know, bit of SQL code, but really all of the questions I'm interested in is when and where did something happen? And it all comes from just pretty simple lists like this, right? People do way more complicated digital humanities stuff than that. Um, mine is just really listing stuff and then making maps that are based on lists of stuff, maps and timelines. Um, so I wanted to say that. The other thing I want to say is that um, even though this, ha you know, this whole thing transpired over 10 years with many different research assistants, with me, you know, until pretty late in the game, not knowing exactly how I wanted to organize the data. Um, but what I was absolutely rigorous about and am to this day is making sure that every single one of the dozens probably of spreadsheets that were generated over the course of this project always had an excellent, unique ID number system and that all of the IDs on any one of those spreadsheets could be linked to one another and could be walked back to its predecessor. So you can see here, right, we have this place ID. This is the work that we're doing this summer. This place ID is a new ID. Um, these old IDs um, reflect the different old ID, right? And we're starting to combine to sort of split and merge entities. And so the old IDs are um, where you see multiple of them. That's where we're merging entities together. Where you see a single one is where we're, we're taking an old ID and moving it into the future. Um, and also, right, we have these upstream IDs, downstream IDs, because those were different previous spreadsheets that we're now cleaning and integrating. Um, so one thing, I, so I guess a couple of takeaways from this, if you're just getting going with um, digital work, if it's this sort of work, is you can get really, really far, really far just with Excel spreadsheets, um, but make sure that you have a really clear methodology, you know what you're doing, and that you are being absolutely rigorous about ID numbers, never lose ID numbers, and never repeat ID numbers. Um, I have a couple of more, right, oh, okay, yes. Um, so right, those old IDs, remember those old IDs from the last one? Um, they come from here. 
And this is the very, very first. If you, a couple of slides ago, I was talking about those, whatever it was, 64 tables from 10 historical sources, all of which link back to original primary sources. That is what you see on this slide here. Um, and so this is an event ID. Again, it's just one, two, three, four, five, right? For my 3,500 or 4,000 different events. Um, each one of them is from a source ID. This is from a table from like 10 years ago, really early on. This was a table of all of those sources and tables like Huangke and Yen Biao, each of which had its own ID number, um, and then a date, a place name, an event type. Um, so with one of my terrific grad students a number of years ago, we classified all of the events into 20 different event types that became really key to the book. And then, right, I'm still a historian. It all goes back to primary sources. Here are the actual, actual strings of text from which we're generating all this information, right? So it goes from primary source, which for the most part I did not read, to these um, secondary sources like Huang He Nian Biao, right, which transcribed the primary sources to this spreadsheet that you see here before you, right? But always linking back, as you can see, this is, um, we're in the 1190s, we're in the year 1194. So most of this is linking back to the Jinshu right to the um, canals and rivers monograph of the gene share. Um, so still history. It's just um, history that aggregates a bunch of, you know, little descriptions like the ones that you can read here. Um, and this also enables me, you know, if I in the future or if anyone, once I make this all public, which I am hoping to do during this academic year, if anyone wants to, you know, um, drill down deeply into what happened in 1194, um, here's everything. You can go back, you can find it in the gene share. Um, so I'm still sort of, you know, engaging in my best understanding of scholarly, of, of historical scholarly method and historical standards in um, being able to trace everything back, every everything, right, on all of those maps with, you know, dots, right? Um, everything absolutely traces back to a primary source inevitably. Um, and this is, right, this is just um, what I showed you is a piece of my downstream data. My upstream data, as I said, is a little bit different because it all comes from the Zhongguo Li Shi Di Chu Ji. So here, um, what I have is um, a year, right? It's a date. Um, the Zhongguo Li Shi Di Chu Ji is a number of snapshot dates. So I have snapshot dates. It is a volume and page in the um, Zhongguo Li Shi Di Chu Ji. And then because everything was digitized, this was all done um, within a GIS environment. We have exact coordinates for these places, names, um, you know, parent, prefect, parent prefectures and provinces. So a little bit different. And the Zhongguo Li Shi Di Chu Ji does not sort of trace all the way back to the primary sources. So um, I, my fidelity here is to that atlas and not to the underlying sources. That would be a whole another piece of research to go back to the primary sources in this particular case. But then of course, this same um, work of um, splitting and merging entities, right? I'm looking at these Sanyings, right? Which clearly are the same place, right? You can see the lat long coordinates are always, the, are almost the same. They're not identical because um, that's basically the, the atlas is just not that precise. It was it was done in the sort of pen and paper era, 60s, 70s. And so um, none of the maps are sort of identical to one another as would be the case if they had all been generated within a GIS. But clearly there's this one place, this these two Sanyings that are clearly the same place, right? And that's just a human judgment. That's not something the computer tells you. It's just logic, same name, um, and same parent and um, almost the same coordinates, one from the Ming, one from the Qing. So we can merge those together, right? As we're doing this final act of splitting and merging to make a single clean gazetteer. Um, that's what I wanna say about method. And then um, basically the last part of this talk, and I'm mindful that we only have 
we only have we have 20 minutes left right is that right yeah yeah um, so, so I, I want to spend the last part of the talk going through some of my some of the conclusions that I'm able to reach about the floodplain history of the Yellow River, backed by all of this data. But let me pause again. This was the sort of the data part of the talk, and um, ask for any questions, comments, requests for for clarification, whatever um, might come up for you. Hopefully this is interesting. Avital. Oh. Yes, hi. Um, it's been, this has actually been a really interesting talk. I've just been start. my husband is a GIS technician for forest research here in Edinburgh. Um, and he's been bugging me to, to combine the two. Um, and I've been quite anxious about it because I don't, I can follow a bit of coding, but like you were saying, you don't have to go so in depth that you can do it yourself. And I think that's just been a really helpful way of approaching it to see how you approached it. And that it's it's so interesting to see the overlaps because, you know, I listened to him yammer on about his trees in uh, <laughs> Scotland. Um, he's Scottish. You can probably tell from my accent that I'm not. Um, and it's, it's just been so interesting to see how you, you combined the two kind of methods of very different spaces into one mm -hmm. cohesive history um yeah. and it's just i just wanted to to say thank you and that it's it's really opened my eyes on how we could kind of do something like that for what i do yeah um mm -hmm. yeah. yeah well that's great and you know one thing and i'll be talking about this more in my talk next week but for a huge amount of historical information, which comes from texts, we don't have the same kind of, right? I mean, you know, forestry GIS would have like sort of continuous, you know, complex, you know, po polygonal data or raster data about, you know, large areas of the earth's surface or some area of the earth's surface. For historians, for a great, great many, a huge percentage of the project that we do as historians, um, because we're starting with text data, what we're starting with is place names, right? We're not starting with sort of the entire course of the river or some area in which temperature varied within certain parameters or something like that. We're starting with names of places. And that's why my method, which is to start with spreadsheets and then to determine the latitude and longitude of places on those spreadsheets is, um, which is also so much easier and does not require very sophisticated GIS expertise at all, um, is actually the thing that's reflective of what is going on in our historical sources, right? Um, most, most historical projects don't need, you know, all of the sort of amount of GIS that you would learn even in like a first semester undergraduate class. We're not dealing, you know, with questions about, you know, topology and adjacency and, you know, a ton of data values about some sort of, you know, complex geographical extent. We're dealing with here's a name, here's where it's located, an XY point on a map. Right. Um, and that, you know, you can do great history without really needing very much GIS at all. Thank you. Let me talk a little bit about the downstream part of the river. Um, I talked about the upstream part. So just sort of where are we at? A sort of an overview of how I used environmental science data to, do, to get the big picture of erosion, what was happening upstream, little introduction to my data. And I want to talk now about some of what I was able to do with that data to understand what was happening on the floodplain, knowing what I knew about erosion, knowing what I knew about the environmental science, and having access to all of that laboriously collected data. Um, so the problem on the on the floodplain of the Yellow River is the problem of what to do with all of that silt. And I have um, on this slide is an image from the 18th century about how to keep the silt from clogging up dams and a picture from the 21st century of the same problem. 
right? Um, if you are on the floodplain of the Yellow River, your goal as a water manager is not to have silt where you don't want silt, in spite of the fact that the rate of sedimentation was rising profoundly and ominously during historical time. Um, what does that look like? This is, again, this is, this is from my data. This is actually an unpublished map that I did with my postdoc, Ryan. Um, this was a sort of an early attempt to just map all of the events in that spreadsheet that you, in, in that um, database that you've sort of seen behind the scenes. Um, how many events happened where, right? And this is what it looks like. Um, and, right, this is the city of Kaifeng. This is an archae, I haven't talked much about archaeology. I hang out with archaeologists as well. I had the great privilege to visit uh, just in like 2019, not long, right, not long before the pandemic started, um, had the opportunity to visit an archaeological site at the old city wall of Kaifeng, where they are excavating sort of all the way down to the bottom of where these layers of sediment were deposited flood after flood after flood. And you can see here in this picture, I have um, the, you know, starting at the UN, 6.5 meters under the present ground. Um, this flood, this sort of um, uh, kind of uh, pond, you can see this sort of um, former pond happened in a flood in the 1660s, you know, and went down to the level of the Ming wall as the this sort of early Qing flood was, you know, not cleared, pooled for months and so on up to the present. It's amazing. Um, Kaifeng, right, almost all of the floods and course changes on the Yellow River emanated from right around the city of Kaifeng. And so aside from anything else, this is also just an example of what you can see with a really preliminary visualization. You take the data, you throw it on a map, and in the same way that I showed you that environmental science data, and I said, wow, a thousand years ago, what happened at that time? Of course, you can also do something with place. You can look at this and say like, wow, Kaifeng, this origin point of all of the floods and course changes throughout all of history, what was going on there? How did people live in a place like that? Um, and so just simply seeing things visually uh, makes, uh, you, you could never ever, I could never have, start at, uh, have started asking questions about what happened there if I didn't have all that data and I didn't see it on a map. Um, Right, and there's another, this is another version of, um, the, of the same data, or sort of a later cleaned version of the data, all the course changes, the city of Kaifeng, all of the historical floods recorded within, I think this is like a 50 kilometer buffer of the, of the, of the point of the city. Um, so you can do a lot. You can also make timelines. Again, this is, I mean, for the rest of this talk, I'm really gonna be looking at what I have done um, with the help of my postdoc, Ryan, with all of this data that we organized. Oh, this is an interesting one. So this is, right, the dotted line here is 50-year moisture variance mean. So one of the other data sets that we brought into our um, database environment was the Monsoon Asia Drought Atlas, because one of the things I was interested in is um, how much of a difference climate and weather variation made in this story. So here we have the Monsoon Asia Drought Atlas, and we have this timeline of historical floods around Kaifeng, um, kind of reinforcing this sort of what happened about a thousand years ago question, which animates so much of my work on this topic. Basically, and the same thing is true, I think I have a future you know, sl slide coming up, um, very, very little flooding until um, right around the time of the founding of the Song, and then a high density, high rate of floods, flooding you know, every decade essentially um, until the end of the imperial era with a couple of anomalies. Somebody asked, I think it was uh, Luang, maybe it was Madalena, um, asked, what about data quality? That is another thing that you can see on this slide. 
So what you can see is that uh, for is that for all intents and purposes, there was no flooding at Kaifeng during the Southern Song and Jin era, in spite of the fact that there was a ton of flooding on both sides of it, right? And um, it is too perfect to be true because they're right exactly. You can see that moment, 1127, right? Um, all, almost all records of floods stop. And then um, 12, um, right, really, tw you know, tw not before 1276, actually, um, 1234 uh, is when, you know, the Yuan conquers the Southern Song, sorry, conquers the Jin, right? And then 1276. Um, uh, UN conquers the Southern Song, and it is just perfectly neat that during the that during that era there are no floods. What I figured out is that basically the records of floods are really significant when the empire is unified because there's trade, transportation, people moving back and forth. The North and South are unified with one another. It is. Um, feasible and desirable to want to manage the river, but during that era of division, none of those things were the case, and so basically record keeping ceased, right? Um, and that's an example of where it took reading in primary sources, reading in secondary sources, doing the kind of just sort of traditional sleuthing that historians do to recognize that what I'm looking at here is a data problem. It's not just like some strange historical anomaly in flooding, right? But again, this would not have been visible until I saw a timeline like this and realized, look at that. It is exactly, this is clearly an issue in political history. It's not an issue in flood history. Um, as opposed to the fact that Right, the rate of flooding is sort of is very low before the Northern Song, moderate in the Song, um, not recorded at all, despite the fact that the Yellow River was completely unmanaged um, and you know quite tumultuous and a great source of human suffering during Southern Song and Jin, just no records of it. Um, really, really high density, super high density of flooding in the Yuan and early Ming and then a very, very low rate of flooding until the um, mid 19th century, basically, or turn of the 20th century, a little bit before the end of the Qing. It turns out that that Ming and Qing story is absolutely a story about human intervention in Yellow River management. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, right, in these four eras, as I talked about. Um, I think I'm gonna skip this just because mostly skip this just because um, time is running short and um, this is a kind of difficult slide to, to explain. But what I want to um, sort of demonstrate here is just that from the from earliest times until the five dynasties era, very, very few floods were recorded and then um, really high density of flooding thereafter with that Southern Song Jin anomaly. And then um, the rest of this is, well, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of move on. I don't wanna to talk too much about this slide, but basically a sort of series of eras, actually I have a star there, so I'll just say a minute. Basically without going into all the detail, what this represents is this sort of high Qing, super ambitious and highly successful effort to put a lot of work into floodplain management and flood prevention from the um, you know, founding of the Qing mid 1600s until everything sort of fell apart in the mid 1800s. And um, essentially what this demonstrates, this sort of low point in this kind of rolling ratio of, um, of breaches to management in the Qing is that this was actually a really well managed river for a long time if what management meant was putting an essentially an infinite, a bottomless amount of money into preventing floods. Um, and, and I'm sorry, I'm sort of rushing now a little bit um, to leave it at that. But again, this is all just building timelines off that data set that I've shown you. 
Um, I think I'll kind of, we're, I know we only have five minutes left. So I think I'm just gonna really quickly just kind of walk through some of this. Um, these are all images from my book and sort of, um, I think rather than talking through these, I'll just say all of these represent the kinds of queries that it's possible to do that, like I said, is just counting stuff, right? Compared to digital humanists who do, I don't know, social network analysis or who do, you know, data mining or, you know, advanced visualization of one kind or another. This is just putting events on spreadsheets and then counting them and then making very simple visualizations. But basically, you know, the entire argument of my book is um, is based off of this and um, you know running out of time here but um, you know just kind of showing you the kinds of um, visualizations that are proper that are possible to make and then you know to drive historical narrative and sort of pinpoint when and where to go back to the primary sources and the secondary sources and say you know what happened then? And what happened then, right? Um, and this is what makes it possible to do the kind of long-term history that I'm trying to do, um, essentially ending here with this proposition that um, basically the sort of the big argument of the floodplain part of the book is that first there were no floods for all intents and purposes up until about a thousand years ago, as I predicted from the environmental science data then there were kind of a few hundred years of allowing the river to flood and then beginning in the late Ming and continuing throughout all of the Qing until the 19th century, um, a really, really intensive, intensive work of river management. And here on this in this historical map from the 18th, I think it was 18th, maybe early 19th century, um, one example of what those pieces of water management looked like, bringing in a little art history here, or a little sort of analysis of material artifacts. Um, another one of my field trips here, looking at a piece of that flood control management in situ. I was actually, this was really cool, right? That little, that stone embankment that you can see in the photograph, I was able to sort of figure out exactly where it was represented on that 18th century map. That was a really good day for me. That was exciting. Um, and that's it. And then just, you know, recollecting that each of these floods that for me is sometimes just like a data point on a map is something that is also always about um, the suffering and resilience of actual human beings. And I always like to end my talks with that point as well, because I'm mindful of the fact that it's easy to sort of lose sight of the human scale with the kind of research that I do. And um, once again, um, acknowledging all of my many collaborators. These are some of my uh, beloved and super hardworking grad students. I have to now add uh, my grad student, Sharon, to this list as well, and my postdoc, Ryan. So um, thank you. I think I talked too long, but we've got a couple of more minutes for questions. Uh, Marlina, you have a question? No, no, I was clapping and, and saying thank you <laughs> for this Sorry. incredible talk, yeah. So we may have time for one quick question if there's any. Otherwise, we would just, uh, let's say this is the end of our today's lecture. Yeah, sorry, I had to rush through the last part. So all of the interesting details of my argument, I was not able to present. So I'm sure it just looks like a bunch of sort of strange lines and dots at this point. But I'll be back again next week. And if you all come back next week, um, you know, we'll have, we can, if, if you want next week, I could start by kind of walking through that last bit of this week's talk where I had to rush before moving on to my next week topic, which is related anyway. Yes, and if you have extra questions, you're welcome to uh, email uh, to uh, us. You can find our email address on our website, or you can tweet us at InSynology. 
Uh, so the recording will be made available uh, shortly on our website. Um, next week on September 8th, uh, Thursday, the same time, we are going to invite Professor Mustang back for her second lecture, which is entitled Modeling Historical Place Names, the Digital Gazetteer of the Song Dynasty and the World Historical Gazetteer. Um, so I would like to give a big thank you uh, to Professor Marston, who offered us a wonderful lecture um, and the insightful uh, methodology. And I would also like to thank um, our organizer, Mariana and Madalena, and for the audience who um, has participated in today's event and who has engaged in our conversation. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you all. I will Thank see you, you next week. Bye. Bye. -bye.